Are you curious about design's core values and how they align with branding your business? What are designers missing? And what should they consider when branding or rebranding their businesses? And should you use your name as the face of your business? Your name has value, but is there a tipping point? Meet my friend, Corey Fuller. Corey earned his master's of fine arts and designs from the University of Central Oklahoma. He currently teaches at Oklahoma Baptist University, where he serves as chair of the Division of Art and Design and holds the Ruth J. Odom Professorship in Fine Arts. Stay tuned to the lightning round as Corey gives us some fabulous tips on managing it all and how he does it with three kiddos, a wife, and a career. You won't want to miss the conversation. Hey, Corey, welcome to the show. Hi, Katie. Thanks. It's so good to have you. Um, I feel like we've had such a good run of people that are not just experts in their field, but they're also really good friends. In fact, we were, before we went on, we were just talking about how um, Corey's wife and I had our kids in uh, kinder music together. And so yep. I don't know how many years, Corey, 15, 10, oh, 15? Probably a 10 lot. years ago, yeah. Yeah, that's gone by a little bit fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a has. little bit fast. So, yeah. Corey, obviously, we know you are the branding expert. And when we were talking about this episode, your eyebrows go up. No, you really are. <laughs> um, we were talking about this episode. And one thing we I wanted to dive straight into with you is the core values of design. Because I think I can say that as designers, we tend to just default to whatever our name is. So it's mm -hmm. Katie Erickson Design. It's it's safe, especially when you're striking out on your own. It feels good. Yep. Everyone knows it's you. Uh, yeah. And it feels like a good spot. But as we grow, mature, and change, we may want to stick with that. And then we have some built-in brand value. But by the same token, we may not. And so yeah. diving in from that standpoint, what are people, especially designers, missing? Or what do they really need to be thinking about when talking about branding their business because brands have value. Right. So I actually teach a class called ad design and we do a self promo project in that class. And I always tell students, you can use your name, you can use your initials, but proceed with caution because your name may change at some point. You know, if you get oh. married, you might change your name. So, um, the other thing to think about is our name is interesting to us. It may not be interesting to other people necessarily. So, <laughs> It's very That's a great point for us. Uh, I had a student several years ago. His name was Cody Smith. And I said, Cody, I love you. You know, you're a unique guy, but your name is not unique at all. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if I love the honesty. Really, <laughs> if you have a really special um, name, it, it might work for you. Uh, the yeah. other thing to think about is if you end up expanding your business, maybe not everyone wants to work under your name. Um, now, if you form a partnership, maybe that's a different situation. But I always tell people to pick something that is a mnemonic device, that's memorable, that's you know catchy, that you can get the Instagram for, you can get the domain name for, mm -hmm. um, all, all those types of things. Uh, just, just because you may not want to have your personal name and your personal brand attached to your company necessarily. Mm -hmm. So it allows for some separation there as well. And I can hear our audience members going, but Corey... I've already done my name. Now yes. what? Yes. So, I mean, a lot of people grow up sketching their own initials, you know, and so they they feel invested in that that monogram they've made of their initials or sure. really in, in, the investment they've made in a community to build trust and things. Mm -hmm. um, I would say starting out, like if you're in a small community, if you had a name, you could say – this is my company and go ahead and still associate yourself with that brand in a pretty significant way. But as you would start to branch out and do more national or international work, uh, then you're just leading with whatever name, whatever moniker you've selected. Uh, because, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, your name does have value. I mean, that's where your integrity lies is sure. in your name. Um, sure. But that's not necessarily what you want to have as your business, as, as the face of your business. So. Is there a magic tipping point? Is it onboarding employees or contractors or what kind of is the tipping point where you should really take pause and not necessarily not use your name anymore, but just have that evaluation moment of now would be a good time if we're going to make this transition to do so, 
or if we're not, we have a good reason why. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, thinking about bands, so sometimes bands will put out Mm -hmm. indie albums and they get really popular, but then they meet with the producer and they say, you know, if you're going to really go places, you need to change your name. And that, that's a, that's a difficult thing. But I, I feel like if you can sort of create a milestone or a benchmark, maybe it's a new client, maybe it's, uh, launching into a new segment or mm. with a different geographic region in the country, those milestones might make that uh, a better case. Um, but we we do always talk about when we're rebranding mm. the the difference between innovation and familiarity. So in that balancing act, so it could be like you've been using a mark um, with a particular color palette, and you could roll that color palette into your new name. So you still have some kind of tie in with familiarity. So you're not frightening off your existing uh, customer base. That's a really delicate balance. I've never even thought about that innovation versus familiarity and how you balance those moving forward in a productive way. What else do we need to think about? Like, I know you have a top 10 list that I think is really helpful of what you need to know when you get ready to brand. Yeah. So I think, Starting at the top, I mean, just to identify yourself. And Mm -hmm. so your brand, your mark is a symbol of of your quality, essentially. So uh, brands are actually very primitive. You know, we've been using pictographs for a long time uh, as as human culture. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And some of the some of the strongest brands that we can think of are the simplest. So if you think of Apple Mm -hmm. or Shell or Target. Uh, those are actually pictographs and they are the thing that you say, you know, so yeah. it's just that brutal simplicity. And so I think we need to remember that we're, we're, we're identifying that's, that's our primary mm-hmm. goal. Uh, the second secondary thing would be to differentiate. So you are who you are, but you're also who you're not. So mm-hmm. Coke sort of makes Pepsi's identity and vice versa. Oh, interesting. So, especially if you're all kind of selling the same thing. So, you know, Coke and Pepsi, it's, it's caffeinated, you know, sugar water, essentially. Um, so they're doing Which we all need as grownups on need. occasion. There's yeah. no judgment if you're an avid fan. No, no judgment. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Coke fan. So and I, I have a strong visceral reaction to Pepsi. I mean, just someone mm-hmm. uttering the word Pepsi. I'm like, oh, you know. Um, yeah. So you need to think about differentiation as well. And uh, so the, the idea of branding, I mean, it, it comes from actually – putting a hot iron on, you know, a cow, um, you know, uh, so like when we think yeah. about branding, it's when actually think about burning, it. burning this image. Um, so if you can think about ranchers and maybe their fence breaks and the cattle are just roaming the plains, that's your way of, of identifying them. So it's to differentiate them maybe from, uh, from another rancher's uh, herd. So anyway, so yeah, to identify and to differentiate, I think those are two, uh, of the primary things that I that I try to think about, at least. I have to say, no one has ever brought up cattle on this podcast yet. This is a new yeah. unfounded territory for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that we're now thinking about design firms in terms of cattle. But the point is yeah. really well made. You have to differentiate yourself from the pack or the herd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else do we need to think about? Um, know that the mark is important. But it's mm. not everything. So that's that's my side oh, of the equation. I design marks for people, <laughs> but it's also the meaning that you're investing into it and managing the meaning because that meaning can change over time for people. Um, so sometimes in design theory, we talk about semiotics. And so you have this signifier and then you have this thing signified and together those make a sign. So just at a basic level, you have... a a red octagon and the thing signified is stopping, right? So we put red octagon together with the idea of stopping and we have a sign now. So you can play that game and you could say, well, what if a red octagon uh, meant go, you know, so culturally we've invested that meaning into that symbol. um, Right. And we, we could change that and mess people up, you know, and we'd have a lot of traffic accidents. But (laughs) back to why more grownups need more caffeine. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The thing to keep in mind, though, is this symbol doesn't really have any meaning or value until you invest that into it hmm. and also train people what what that symbol means. So um, I want people to think about the look of their logo and the typography, but moreover, think about the meaning they're investing into it. 
So with that, I'm going to take a rabbit hole for a minute. How important mm -hmm. is our tagline? Is Are we getting to the point where we're so short in our attention span as Americans that we really just need like a logo? And like even like Starbucks, they don't even really call it Starbucks anymore. You just see the mermaid tail and you know where yeah. you are in the designated right. green. When I think about branding back in the day, 20 years ago, back when I started my business, it was you need a name, you need a logo, and then you need a tagline like ours was, and we still use it quite a bit, but turning spaces into places. How mm -hmm. relevant is that in the modern world to have those three components to build a brand? Is it needed? Yeah. So as far as the tagline or the, the watchword you would use, yeah. um, I if you ask people just in the general public, could you recite this slogan mm. or this tagline. Um, yeah. You might get mixed results. Then you would decide, well, maybe this isn't effective. I think it is actually good for your internal culture for, for people to know, you know, this is who we are. This is who we stand for. So um, I used to work at a bank before I got into teaching full time. And so our watchword mm -hmm. was simple beginnings, strong tomorrows. Yeah. And that, that was mimicked in the logo because it had an acorn and it had a post oak leaf. So you had the uh, simple beginnings and then you had the strong tomorrows with the leaf. So that yeah. tree going to maturity. And we were trying to create a financial story for people. Sure. And so for us, like that had a lot of meaning. Now, if we yeah. asked our customers, you know, what's what's your slogan? What's your tagline? I don't know if they would know it, but internally it, it meant a lot to us. And hopefully that was conveyed you know, in mm -hmm. some way, even at a subconscious level and how we worked with people. That makes complete sense. So not really necessary externally, but very important internally, potentially to create yeah. that culture. Absolutely. Yeah. What else do we need to think about when we're branding? So I'm going to rip off some Marty Neumeyer here. Um, do it. He, he says the brand is not who you say it is. It's who they say it is, meaning the general public. Uh, so we have a the little implied bit implied versus the inferred. <laughs> you yeah. can apply one thing, but if they're inferring another, it yeah, doesn't really right. matter. Yeah. So we we have con some control. And the reason we're doing a podcast like this is we believe we have some control in how we manage our brand. It's not sure. just complete anarchy. Um, but we do need to wrestle with the idea that, to, to quote Neumeyer again, a brand is a, a person's gut feeling. You know, so mm -hmm. if I say Target, you have a reaction. If I say Walmart, you have a reaction. If I say Oklahoma, you know, I'd be kind of frightened to see what people might think. <laughs> Home. <laughs> We're Home's with the Oklahoma, reaction. With Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, but we have probably a precognitive reaction just based mm -hmm. on hearing a word or a brand. So uh, we need to be mindful of that. Great points. What else? Um, knowing your channels, knowing how to communicate. So, um, you know, if you're a local business, it might make sense to still run ads in a local magazine or newspaper or, or school yearbook, but we also need to think about the medium as the message. So how does mm. this particular medium we're using sort of makes a suggestion about what kind of business we are. Um, I often use the example of if you had an attorney and he had racing lights going around his sign <laughs> or, or a doctor for that matter. <laughs> It feels like, a little bit like Better Call Saul to me, Corey. Yeah, it would. <laughs> I'm so, just saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it that's, gives that's, its own messaging. Yeah. Yeah. People intuitively yeah. pick up on that. If this seems professional, if it seems kind of amateur. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to say all local advertising is amateur because that's not the case. So, you know. Especially, yeah. yeah, that's your target demographic and that's where they are. It's right. probably more the how than the where. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. And and the why, just thinking through the why of it. Like why are we spending our ad dollars this way? Um there there's an old uh, quote that says I'm wasting half my advertising dollars. I just don't know which half. So <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of solopreneurs feel that way and that it's yeah. really hard. And not even solopreneurs, there's a lot of firms too that can feel that way of you kind of feel like you're throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. But I think it really comes Same. back to knowing who is your target demographic. I always like to say, if you're trying to be everything to everyone, you are nothing to no one. And mm -hmm. it, we just can't meet everybody's yep. needs and wants, which is our job as designers, ideally, is we meet our clients' needs and wants. Well, you can't know their needs and wants till you zero in on your niche. And your niche is going to leave pe other people out in the cold. And that's just yes. part of business. You just have to know what appeals. Um, 
it's very rare that you would see like a very swanky payday loan center, right? Like there's right. just, you know, your target demographic, their job is to catch your attention and bring you in. That's a whole different dynamic than say the banking system you were in where you're trying to tell a story yeah. of moving from, you know, the acorn to the oak leaf. It's just yeah. a whole different yeah. genre. Yeah. Very when true. we had had Rebecca Ellison on the uh, show a while back and she was talking about the value of just putting your face out there and they're building a relationship with you prior to ever engaging with you. Um, mm -hmm. And they've, you can really sell yourself and your brand long before you, they ever do that discovery call or book that discovery call, which I think is so valuable. I think this all works in tandem and that you can, whether you choose to be your brand or you choose to build a different brand, just knowing who you are and who you're going after and yeah. being okay, realizing you're not going to get everyone. And that can be hard, especially when yeah. you're starting out or you were trying to grow your business. You're like, maybe we should do this and this and this. And back to your point about ad dollars, like, we're just going to try it all and see what sticks, right? Yeah. yeah. Not helpful. That's the last thing you probably want to do, actually. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, that that's my that's my number one tip actually so is it really it, sorry yeah. did i steal your thunder that's horrible yeah okay. it's a, yeah, yeah oh. you're gonna please everybody so i mean there's a reason bernie sanders was a viable candidate there's a reason donald trump was a viable candidate you sure know, not how anybody feels about those people but they're very different but they both had uh, really strong followings so very strong followings <laughs> extremely strong followings let's talk about mistakes we make in our brand okay. i think that's one that's really easy going back to where we started the conversation of just like my default is my name i'll put it in a pretty font and pick a color yeah. i like yeah um what mistakes do you see people making with branding especially as not only an expert on this but someone who teaches on it that when you see it, you're like do the head smack of oh no they did it again um that yeah. we can prevent here yeah so i mean I, i'm thinking about people starting out um, and, and you just want to have, I'm going to get technical for, for just a Please second. Do. You, you want to have a good vector of your logo. And so all that means, if your listeners don't know what a vector might be, um, it just means it's, it's scalable. So it's not a pixel based graphic. Um, it's line oriented, it's object oriented. So it would scale up to a billboard or down to a business card. Um, and also creating negative space around your identity system. Uh, That's really yeah. You don't want to let things encroach on your logo. Um, and just think about how it's presented. So always having that high resolution file or that vector file out there. Um, you can slap your logo on a lot of different things these days. And I, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that. You know, like if someone says, Hey, we can put your logo on a rug. Well, what does that imply? You know, you want someone wiping okay. <laughs> on your logo. So, um, so yeah, consistency is key. So like, let's say you're working with a service provider, like a screen printer, sure. make sure they get that vector file. If you're working with a sign person, make sure they have that vector file. Uh, also using consistent typography and it can be a serif, it can be a sans serif, but think about what, what does that typeface mean? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, what does it elucidate? Um, so if you're more formal, you may want to use a, a serif. If you're more modern or contemporary, maybe use a sans serif. Uh, but using that that vector logo and using that consistent typeface in everything you do. And then it will be to the point where when people see a particular typeface, they'll even think of your brand without the logo, which is a pretty cool place to be. Man, if you can get there, that's money. I love yep. what you said, too, about white space. I think white space in the world of graphic design is often like a great wine. You got to have it. It cleanses the palate. So when you do get that punch of color or that beautiful typeface or whatever it is you're going for, you can actually see it. There's nothing that personally drives me nuts more than I look at a business card and I just go cross eyed because I'm like, do I look here? Do I look there? Do I look yes. there? Do I look there? Yeah. And you're like, I get that you want to share all that, but I'm not seeing anything because my eyes are just crossing and I have nowhere to land yeah. when I look at something or billboards. I feel like are notorious for that. Like, oh, we have this much space. We're going to fill it with everything under the sun. And you're like driving by and you're like, your brain just is like system <laughs> shut down because <laughs> yeah. you just can't get there. Right. Talk about building your brand. And um, we always segue into um, some of the personal parts of business because we are holistic beings. How do you build your brand if you're listening to this and you're part of a firm um, and you're saying, well, my name isn't on it. I love what I do, but I also want to have my own identity and be appreciated for my work. How have you been able to do that at your university um, mm -hmm. walking your journey? And what would your advice be to other people who are in that same situation where they 
aren't standing here as a solopreneur or as the principal of the firm, but they very much want to still carve out that space, if you will. Yeah. So, so most companies, if they're handling their image well, they'll have some sort of graphic standards manual. Yes. And so what you want to think about is how can I be creative, but within that, within those parameters. So mm. um, when I was with Legacy Bank, I was sort of in charge of managing that brand. And it was a really delicate balance because we wanted to give each of our stores the ability to do their own marketing and not like come in heavy handed and say, you can't do that, you know, but also everybody wants a little autonomy in life. Yes, yeah. Right. But also yeah. make sure it's consistent. And so sometimes when you, when you distribute a, a brand standards manual, people think, oh, I can only use this logo and I can only use this typeface. Well, in reality, there's a lot of creative freedom you would have, you know, in different campaigns you might run uh, within that. So, um, you know, when we, had multiple designers on staff, I could tell which designer did which piece, but it was still within the standards, you know? So okay. um, I, I think if you can think about your, your market in terms, in terms of segments, um, you might have someone on your team that really speaks in the vernacular of this particular audience. This, this person's 18 to 20, this person is going to hit that 50 to 60 demographic. That's a great point. But it's still going to be with that same, that same brand personality to it. I think that's a, yeah. Well, and understanding there's value, not just that they may hit different um, people or different demographics or segments, but there's value in them doing so. And it's your chance to give them the freedom to do that because then you are in a position to capitalize on that value. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's immensely important. Okay. So you're a dad of three girls I am. Um, and you're out here doing design in mm -hmm. a, a different genre than say interiors, um, but still designing and being creative. Yeah. How... Are you keeping all the wheels on your bus, <laughs> so to speak? How, how are you doing this out here and still finding time? One thing we always talk about is you can't pour out of an empty cup. We say it on almost every episode. Yeah. For all of us creatives out here, the cup has to get filled before we can go out and create and do and be. And you've done some really cool billboards. Corey's done some Thanks. amazing billboards around Oklahoma that are just stunning. Where are you finding the time, the energy, and what places are speaking to you as you continue to fill up your cup? Yeah. So, I mean, you did mention I have, I have three girls. Um, I'm 40 plus right now. I'll just say that. So yeah, after 40, we all use the plus mark. It's okay. We don't have to, we don't have to get specific. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just being a little more intentional about which projects I want to take on mm. and also determining the why of that. So I, I always tell my students, I want you to do free work. I don't want you to do free pitching or design contests or things like that necessarily, but do some sure. some pro bono work that's just good for your soul. So maybe you're a part of a nonprofit or you're part of a church and you want yeah. to do work for those organizations because you have something to offer to them. So that's actually counterintuitive. You would think doing more work makes you lose your soul or whatever, but like <laughs> those are sort of enriching kinds of things to be helpful in those, those nonprofit spaces. I love um, that. So yeah, so being kind of choosy about what you do, um, I think I think professional development is always important. So you know, if you need to take a class or brush brush up on some software, um, that can yeah, that can be really good as well. So um, you know, sharpening the axe from time to time is is really critical. So um, hmm. I and this this sounds counterintuitive as well because you don't no. want to dwell too much on the past, but sometimes when you're in a really busy chapter of life, which I'm I'm in that right now. For I kind sure. of go back and I look at some of the old stuff that I've done. Some of it I'm really critical of. I'm like, oh, that was that was garbage, you know. But some <laughs> of it I think, you know, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. And you so you kind of give yourself like a little personal pep talk to say, you know, I've done some good work in the past. I'll continue to do good work, hopefully. But maybe in this chapter right now, it's just not a season where I'm feeling particularly productive. But that will come back because it ebbs and flows. It so does, and I think giving ourselves the grace to hang mm. out in that space. Yeah. I'll never forget being in a yoga class and the instructor said, um, we're coming into fall, was coincidentally last year at this time. And just like the leaves and the trees go from being outward facing to being inward facing and they come in and they could cocoon so that next spring they will burst forth again. And I was like, huh, never really thought about it like that. Like that was a major eye opener for us type A firstborns who plow ahead through all seasons like it is spring to mm. say, huh, Maybe I need a fall 
not just as a person, but as a creative to say, I'm going to come in and cocoon for a minute. So when we come out of the gate, we can blossom and create right. new things. That's you alluded good. to something you said, um, the power of choosing the projects you want. And I think that's something to go back to your 40 plus comment. I've gotten a lot more comfortable with in my 40 plus years um, is saying no and just mm -hmm. saying, I don't think this is a good fit or we've gotten to the point where I'm so sorry, we're not doing those types of projects anymore or being gracious and still offering the decline and choosing to work with the people that energize you and yeah. are creative as well. We've all had the client that feels like your soul's kind of being shot backed. And once you experience that, it's yeah. very empowering to say graciously, no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that idea of a gracious decline, I need to work on that one. Cause I'm usually just, <laughs> no, <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. There's an element of personality in this for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. There's do that because you might want to work with that client later. So yeah, not burning that bridge is probably pretty important. Well, and I think the word, the, and especially black and white type A people, sometimes we can be like this where it's either red or green um, in life, but they're just like stoplights. There's a chance for yellow, the not right now. I love that you said that because like you said, this season's very busy and very full of all the things. And it's not that I'm saying no, I'm just saying not right this moment. We have a full plate. Let's try again later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's so incredibly smart. What else are we missing um, as designers that you would say, make sure and keep an eye out for this. If you go to rebrand or you're coming into a branding season or you know, when I feel like that always pops up is we get a brand and then we sit on that brand and five years go by and we're still sitting on that brand. Yeah. How do you know when to brand refresh and back to your point of innovation versus familiarity, keeping some of that going. I mean, is there a good timeline we should be looking at in our firm saying every three years we should revisit that or? Yeah. So three years seems good to me. I think five okay. years, and this is probably a personal preference and it would depend on what kind of market you're in as well. Um, Fair point. So as, as a graphic designer, I, you know, I was trained in that Swiss style of graphic design, you know, high modernism. So you make this mark and it's minimalistic and it never needs to change. You know, it's just, mm. it's just sort of invested with whatever meaning you put into it. That's not, I mean, in the postmodern world, that's not exactly where we are anymore. So, you know, from every three to five years, we probably do need to examine it. Um, I'm a big list maker. So I, you know, always make a list of pros and cons like, okay, we could rebrand, which would give us this, but it will also take this away and it would cost us this much. So, Websites probably the easiest thing to do. Any any kind of digital presence is super easy to you know put a new brand on. Um, sure. If you're a brick and mortar, you got signage. If you have customers, um, you know, engaging with a physical space, it's just going to be more expensive. You know, uniforms sure. uh, for your employees. So those mm -hmm. weigh pretty heavily in, in the pro and con. Um, also, it depends on like what you're working towards, and also maybe something mm -hmm. you're moving away from. So if you're trying, not I'd say baggage, but if you're kind of saying this is who we aren't anymore, yeah. that's, that's a great time to to do a rebrand. Um, now, I will so one like caveat I would put in if if you think you're just going to rebrand and everybody's like, oh, they must be new and different and better. That's not necessarily the case. You'll have to kind of re-earn that trust and let's say, okay, they have this new look. Is their customer service any better? Is their yeah. product any better? And if it's not, then, whoa, you've just like flushed all that rebranding money down the drain. Straight down the drain. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a key component, especially if you're brick and mortar, but to think of all the avenues. One thing too, I would say is if you're getting ready to go through a major growth period, mm -hmm. um, that's like a time to pay attention to that too, because the further in you go, this hit me the other day, because we have the coaching side of our business. We have the um, podcast, obviously the webcast and our listeners here, we have the design firm still all of those colors are symbiotic, but they have different logos and brands among them. If we were to try to unravel our brand now, it would be crazy. But yeah. doing it a year ago is a perfect time to tweak our colors and update as we knew we were going into a season of massive growth a um, year and a half ago or so. And mm -hmm. that worked out really, really well for us because we saw that there's going to be all these incarnations and we want to get ahead of that with something we like out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Lightning round time. Okay. I love lightning round. Yeah. All right. Let's go for it. One book that has most changed your life and why? So the book would be Jaber Crow, which is by Wendell Berry. And 
I would need to also specify I read this book while I had COVID. <laughs> that was <laughs> okay, so a little bit of a different lens. <laughs> I was in a room alone for a week. And it was like a really um, difficult time. So it probably, if I'm I go sorry. back and read it, it may not have the same impact, but it's about this guy and he struggles with his vocation and his calling mm. and he ends up being a barber in his hometown. And he's almost like a therapist for, for the town. For sure. Um, he's in love with this woman who's married. So that that's sort of the conflict in the story. Uh, yeah. But there's there's sort of a contrast to Jaber and this guy named Troy. And he's a farmer, but he overworks his land. He overplays mm. his hand. And mm. so that's sort of the the story to not be followed. Um, you know, if we're trying to to make it a parable. Um yeah. he's, he's all about efficiency, just squeezing as much as he can out of his land. And um Jaber has taken a, a different path. So I love yeah, that. It's a really it's a really powerful book. It's a powerful power, powerful story. It probably has more meaning coming into this season of life too. I don't know that I would have appreciated that so much in my twenties yeah. or even my early thirties, but sitting here comfortably seated in the mid forties, yeah, man, that resonates just even hearing the synopsis of it. Yeah. We all have um, limits. And so we have we to do. recognize that. Yeah. We're human. We're just human. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of twenties and thirties, what advice would you have given your 20 year old self if you could go back? In well, my 20 year old self. So I would have been in college at that time. I was kind of, before I met my wife, geared towards like monasticism. I thought, I'm not going to marry. I won't have kids, a house. <laughs> <laughs> Three kids and a wife later who was the yeah. sweetest wife ever, by the way. Yeah. 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 Totally well, different. Yeah. So I, I think I would have told myself just to chill out a little bit. I was just mm. anxious and kind of high strung and probably kind of arrogant as well. Sure. Sure. Um, which was, you know, compensating for all my, my nervousness. Um so yeah, just to, just to listen to people, be humble and listen to people. I think that that the people that care, you you don't want to listen to every voice out there, but the people that are really caring about you, that are investing in you, um, li just listen to them. Mm, such wise words, because I, I forget who said it, but like basically, the older I get, the more I realize, the less I know. Yeah, uh, right. and that's such a that's a great spot to be in. That's like one of one of our mantras is tell me what I'm missing. Yeah, I know I'm missing something. Feel free to yeah. tell me what it is, especially when, like to your point, when it comes from someone you trust mm -hmm. uh, and you know who really does care. That's a big yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. And I know, especially as we've talked about, we're in a busy season of life. And whether you have one kid, five kids, no kids, a spouse, no spouse. I don't know anyone who says, oh, my plate has tons of room on it. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, what is your time hack? What have you found to be a way that you can make it through the day? Uh, a tip, a trick, a hint. Yeah. So I read a book called Deep Work a few years ago by Cal Newport. It's yeah. a great book. And one of the tips he gives in that is sort of shutting down at the end of your day. So not just like throwing the laptop in the bag and rushing out the door, but, you know, 30 or so minutes before you're going to end your work day, think about, okay, what do I have to do tomorrow? Um, yeah. What do I need to wrap up like right now? So I don't have to think about it while I'm at home. So that idea of when you That's leave, work, and not all of us have that physical workspace. So it probably becomes more important, but I'm, I'm going to concentrate on this and I'm going to say, okay, I can't solve this right now. I'm going to push this to another day, not to put it off, but to plan for it. And then when I'm at home, I can just be me at home or be the dad or, you know, whoever I need to be in my, my various roles. And that way I'm not occupying my mental energy thinking about work while I'm at home. Cause yeah. you almost have to like think about physically, like putting it in a bag and zipping it up, you know, totally. I'm not going to pull this out until tomorrow or Monday or something. Um, so that, that's, it's not like a time efficiency hack necessarily, but it's like a mental energy hack to where, so I used to make this bad habit and I would take my laptop home and think, I'll do this after the kids go to bed. And then all night I'm thinking about like, I've got to do this thing tonight. And then I just wouldn't do it. And I th I started thinking if I, if I'll just tell myself and, and, and kind of cultivate the time for it, then I won't have to have all the mental strain, like sort of procrastinating about it. I'm just like, I'm going to start this at this point. So that's been helpful for me. I think I think it's amazing because you go into the next day feeling so much more refreshed and like you have had the right. mental space yeah. instead of this like looming cloud of should pull out laptop and produce more work, right? Mm. Instead yeah. it's like I've spent time with my kids, I've been a good dad. 
we've dealt with all the feelings and had all the after school conversations and we made it through dinner and everyone's still yeah. alive, which yeah. sometimes is hard depending on what's being served. <laughs> My kids wail and gnash their teeth. But then you can go into the next day and you can say, okay, now I'm here. This is the time. This is the space. Yeah. yeah. And being, I and love being that. really present in each of those roles in each of those places. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. This was wonderful. Thank you, Corey, so much for your time. What a great conversation. Thank it was you. A pleasure. So thank you.